Hello, and welcome to the Business of Authority. I'm Jonathan Stark. And I'm Rochelle Moulton. Today, we're going to share some interesting ways to monetize your expertise. Let's make some money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if you're a steady listener, you might have noticed us kind of branching into this rabbit hole in the last episode last week and we decided to pump the brakes and devote an entire episode just to this particular topic so if that was a cliffhanger then we're about to close the open loop for you <laughs> i'm sure everyone was just waiting with bated breath yes pins and needles <laughs> yes <laughs> all right so uh, we were we were talking last week about you know so the rules changing and someone who had uh, had a successful business selling things a particular way a particular package of their expertise and f- for whatever reason probably reasons outside of their control that just started declining and then it was like geez like i'm cranking the uh, engine and nothing's it's just not mm. starting back up so it was suggested to perhaps try a different package expertise in a different way and boom sure enough like it it took off right away. Same expertise, just presented in a different way for a different buyer and a different outcome. Uh, but, you know, same skills. So it's like mm-hmm. pretty cool. And over the years, we have come across a lot of different examples of things that some are probably maybe a little more obvious than others, but um, we wanted to run down the list to perhaps get people's gears turning if they were thinking about packaging their expertise in new ways or experimenting with new ways to do it, perhaps more profitably or in a way that's more in your genius zone or just flat out more fun. Yeah. I like the last one too. More fun. Where should we start? We've got, I've, I've got a bunch of sort of scribbled notes here and maybe have 20 different things to talk about in just sort of four broad groups like tools, book related things, group delivery related things subscription stuff miscellaneous i guess that's five but yeah the one to there's some of the stuff is kind of one-to-one stuff but right it, it will drop it in because i think the the tools one is unique to the software developers in the audience maybe because maybe. i suppose we could hire somebody to build a tool based on our expertise yeah and there's no code self-assessment type of stuff and but but yeah generally speaking i would say that this is mostly the the domain of people who have access to software expertise. So maybe maybe we could kind of run through those real quick because I think they're pretty straightforward. It's not going to be shocking to anybody who has those skills and it w- won't be useful to anybody else. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I've seen is pretty interesting is creating an open source package and selling services on top of that where um, something like, I remember there was something called... Uh, what was it? Sli- image slideshow or something like that, that was heavily used in lots of different photo applications. And the developer, you know, and it, it was just like a basic version. It did some things, but if you wanted it extended or you needed something custom or you're having some problem with it, then, you know, who are you going to hire? You're going to hire the person <laughs> that built it. And so that's, that's pretty interesting. Obviously it's contingent on people using your thing and, and having it be a, an important part of their product or something like that, but that's not impossible. Mm-hmm. A more obvious one is to build a, a plugin or an extension or something like that for an existing platform, like a, for example, a Salesforce app, I think they're called, or a Shopify app, or like a Chrome extension, or uh, some sort of ugh, what's that ERP? It doesn't matter. the The point is, you can, <laughs> you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> yeah, Netsuite. That's what I'm trying to think of. So you can build these these plugins or extensions or, uh, or WordPress is another one, duh. And, you know, sell those for whatever the business ones, a lot of them are a hundred bucks a month per user. So you can, you can make money off of that. Uh, maybe moving up the, moving up the level of intensity or the cost to create, you could build a SaaS, Of course, every software developer is going to think of that. Uh, I won't even go into that. Um, and then there's an sort of a, an interesting one that, I, I'm working with some folks on where they have created a bunch of tools, almost like a SaaS or like a, um, a headless SaaS, just like an API that they're using as their own sort of secret weapons to offer managed services to clients. Mm. So if you imagined like, I don't know, something like someone's trying to churn out like tons of content or they're trying to like maintain uh, or increase their conversion rates on their website or their SEO, anything like that. And it's a thing that you would normally do 
kind of like a project, maybe a freelancer would help them with this sort of thing on an hourly basis or whatever. But they came up with some really clever ways and some to, to build tools that made a lot of the grunt work of those sorts of things way easier, like really easy. So they can, so they present themselves as kind of like, uh, it's sort of like a SaaS, but it's really not, you know, because they're, they don't, the client doesn't get access to any tools. Yeah, they just get access doing to the, the work. people, right? They're so just saying, I have this really cool, well, they're not even saying this. I have this proprietary stuff. Right. And that allows us to be hyper efficient and charge you a bunch of money to right. do managed services. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So those, those were the, developer -y things that I've you know what I want to add something to this that I just occurred to me now which may be something you could add to this that's not just developer -y, <laughs> um, is assessments the kind of assessments that I'm thinking people who are in the leadership or executive coaching space like maybe you invent a an assessment tool that you know, you use in your work is one thing, but maybe you license it mm -hmm. and you have a system. And so that I've seen that done yep. um, outside of the software space. Yep. Actually, licensee was something I had written down for the non-software people. But yes, you could, of course, do that same thing with software. Yeah. Cool. What's What are some stuff, some things that you had that were maybe a little more applicable to our audience for this show? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that just captured my imagination, I'm going to dive right into an event like, I think that um, doing live events is something a lot of us don't really think about unless it's just a, like a webinar to promote, you know, to get people to buy something. And there are two live events that uh, are on my radar right now. And one is uh, the MYOB, which Jonathan, you've spoken at, and now mm -hmm. I've spoken at that with David C. Baker. And it's very oriented towards uh, creative business owners, but it also has a lot of his personality in it. Mm -hmm. And there's so I think of both of these examples I'm using as personality oriented events, which also give their attendees a lot of value. So David C. Baker's is pretty low key. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff in it, but it's very much tied to who he is, his books, how he talks about ideas. The other one is by Rachel Rogers, who wrote We Should All Be Millionaires. And her live event is the Millionaire Summit. And it's three days in January in Puerto Rico. And for $24.95, $2,495, you can attend. And they have some, you know, cool speakers and stuff. But what I think was genius is that she created multiple tiers. So there's the general, then there's the silver mm -hmm. for $7,500. And there's a bunch of stuff included in that. But let me go to the gold, which is $14,000. So this is $14,000 is your entrance fee for a live event with presumably dozens, maybe even 100 or 200 people. So this is not like a small, intimate gathering, but um, talking about personality. So you get a photo op with her. You get to attend an author book signing. You attend a VIP happy hour where you meet all the speakers. Um, you get a... Um, uh, uh, accelerated um, check-in so you don't have to wait. You get um, access to, I had to love this, to the millionaire terrace. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, so much status. Like, And the, the, the lanyard is gold and you have... <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And I, I know, I don't want this to sound like I'm making fun of this because I'm not. I actually think this is really genius. Mm. And, it, and she couldn't just do that if she didn't have a successful book. So this started, in my view, this started with her book and what she created from the book, which is the community. And she's got a point of view, an ethos on um, women, people of color, LGBTQ people um, being millionaires. Like, why not? So it's mm -hmm. really, it's all a genius concept, but I just love how she has, you know, figured out how to do this at a really high level. Yeah, that's great. I just came back from Disney and they do a great job of, of uh, offering whatever level you want to invest into the experience. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you and I could go to the same conference and I could be thrilled to pay $2,500 and have an amazing experience and make my money back 10 times over. 
I could also go and spend $14,000 potentially and make 10 times over. I mean, it, it, it just depends. Mm-hmm. And when I say make 10 times over, that could be in revenue, but it could also be in knowledge, in confidence, in contacts. I mean, it just depends what you want and what experience uh, you are willing and able to pay. Mm. So I just, my point is, you know, don't scoff at these kinds of things. Just think about them and think about whether there's something in this that could apply to you and your situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a, uh, you're, you're speaking my love language when you talk about tears. <laughs> <laughs> I love tiered services or tiered, you know, options. Yes, love exactly. It. Yeah, exactly. You, you never and know I would much... love to look at the at the numbers. It would be so interesting. But I did notice, and I, I'm, it's been a few days since I looked at it. I think it was the silver one. Um, they had some that were sold out. Like I think they had, so if you have early bird pricing, which they do, and then they had a certain number of silver and gold packages available at X price. And then when those sold out, the price would go up. <laughs> So that's that's your second love language, yeah, not, right? Yeah, right. She's not fooling around with the pricing. <laughs> yeah, serious. no, it's very serious. I, yeah. I really, I really admire what what they're trying to do with this. Impressive, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and that I do want to loop back real quick to the um, managed services and SaaS and some of that stuff, like tiers. Make all of that stuff. Tiers is a great thing to experiment with. You know, not just like. Um, not just the ultimatum price. It's like, take it or leave it. This is how much it is. Uh, You can do that with just so many things, so many things like, uh, like you, like this is, I did a micro example of what you just described when we had Joe Pine on the show. After that, I wanted to experiment with doing like a in-person workshop, if you can imagine. And I ran that a couple of times and I had a tier. It was just two tiers. One was the, you know, the basic uh, workshop and then there was another one where because it was a two-day thing so everybody had to stay overnight and then i so i offered like uh you know signed copy of of hourly billing is nuts and uh, we take you out to dinner like a vip dinner and people took me up on it there you go yeah i don't remember the prices but it was like it was do you think you made money on the on the second tier oh, yeah. i mean you had expenses according yeah okay yeah. I, I figured but <laughs> right yeah. yeah, definitely. It was yeah. more profitable than the first tier, yes, for sure. Yeah. You're and upgrading was, experience, but you're making it optional. Yeah, it's optional, right. Yeah. So, yeah, all it, I almost said always a good idea. Nothing's always a good idea, but it is often a good idea to experiment with adding value at higher tiers just to, see, to find out if you're leaving money on the table. There might be people who are who happily pay you more uh for the level that they think is appropriate to to wherever they're at if you know what i mean oh i learned that in my first course my very first one i had three options and everybody bought the most expensive one which (laughs) obviously means i didn't price it right (laughs) a little low yeah (laughs) yeah you think that was maybe off but but yeah but it told me something about what they wanted Mm -hmm. and what they valued so Yeah. yeah and how much they would expect to pay for the thing that they think it is yes yeah Okay, cool. So live events, and I just sort of mentioned a workshop. So maybe we go into this sort of groupy category where maybe you've been doing one-on-one stuff and you decide to offer your expertise or package your expertise or monetize it in some kind of a group setting. So a live event would be one example. That's pretty extreme. Live events yeah. have a lot of moving parts, but it's not, you know, putting together that in-person workshop was... I made it harder than I needed to because we did a whole bunch of like tried to get kind of fancy, but it was it wasn't really that it was work, but it wasn't that heavy of a lift. And all of the work was like formatting and printing out the workbooks and arranging for lunch. You know, it was it wasn't stuff you can hire out. Yeah, once you figure out what you want to do, you can hire out the execution. Exactly. And you only have to figure it out once, really, like the heavy lift. Mm -hmm. and, And I was excited to do it. So that part was fun anyway. Um, but yeah, but you could put together, whether it's in person or not, you could put together some kind of group thing like an in-person workshop or like I do the cohort based online workshops where it, it, it's a group and they have, they can connect with each other and compare notes and so forth, but there's like a start date and an end date and it's, it's Mm -hmm. time bounded versus, 
just selling like a self-paced video course where people go through on their own at their own pace. They don't know who else took it. There's no community uh, aspect to it, which of course is another way to package your expertise. Well, well, actually, I just want to mention one uh, one um, membership program that I think were we on membership? Was that part of what we were talking about? <laughs> I think it was. That's also in the group category. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Jenny Blake, who I'm so excited, she's coming on Soloist Women in in a few weeks. Um, she created a group called BFFs that it's for heart based. Um, entrepreneurs or business owners and what she does I've never seen this done before so you pay an annual fee to get in but once you do that your fee never changes so if I pay a thousand dollars a year and next year she raises the price to twelve hundred dollars I still pay a thousand dollars as long as I stay in the program and the way she explains that is she's because it didn't used to cost that much it used to be a lot less Mm -hmm. is that she wanted to reward the people who were with her early on when there wasn't as much information behind Mm -hmm. the paywall I like this and yeah I I really like that and I felt like it's in alignment with the heart-based entrepreneur concept Mm -hmm. and it just it said something to me about how she runs her business so I, I like that example cool I hasten to add that I think there's, there's, you, what am I trying to say? I feel like not everybody's positioning or expertise lends itself to an audience that makes sense for some of these group things, particularly a membership. Yes. Where there's, uh, let's see, from the developer standpoint, I haven't seen a lot of stuff work. So what I mean by that is like, if you're, if you're like really good at some language, PHP, Go, JavaScript, whatever, uh, node, something react, it doesn't seem to work. It's not sticky enough to say, oh, you know, pay nine bucks a month, 90 bucks a month, whatever, to be in this community of people who use this language or use this tool. And I think probably it's because there are already a jillion free places for those mm-hmm. people to, to have yeah. those conversations. So that doesn't seem to work very well. I've seen a version of this where people it's, it's a private community in the sense that it's like a, a, a company who has a bunch of, let's say react developers would hire someone who wrote the book on react to have almost like an internal coaching or mentorship program it's kind of like a membership Mm -hmm. and the idea is that if if any of these developers are getting stuck on something or they've got a question about how to architect something or how to go about solving a particular problem in the in the most attractive way for the situation i've seen people sell that and and every time it like dies pretty quickly like th- there's some, I don't know what it is exactly, but there's some psychology that happens where either the developers resent is a strong word, but they just don't want to ask for help or they don't, or f- for whatever reason, it's just dead silent. No one is asking them questions. It could be that they resent them. It could be that they're embarrassed to admit that they don't know the answers to these questions. I don't know, but it's usually not very active unless you get like one or two people that won't do anything without getting approval from the coaching person, which is super (laughs) annoying. Yeah. So it's not something I'd want to run. Yeah. It's that, so that, that isn't that I've not seen that work yet in terms of membership. So, but if you were like, if you were like, um, this react developer, you could get a group of react developers in a community around how you built your business or how to do marketing to get more leads or like you would get a community around that but Mm -hmm. it's a different expertise it's just that you've got you've got the react skills in common with the people that would be in the community so maybe that's like we're sort of birds of a feather and aspirationally you attract people who want to have a you know more of a business like yours maybe it's info product or you know maybe you're west boss and you've got a really successful video course business and they want to find out more about how you did that but you're not going to be teaching them react well it's teaching technical skills versus 
anything related to running your business. Yeah, business skills, those, right. Yeah, those are just totally different. And most of us don't start businesses until we have the technical skills, at mm-hmm. least, you know, a base of technical skills. So we might take a course to learn something. I mean, I would do that, but I oh, yeah. probably wouldn't join a group about the technical skill. Right. The technical skill, It's there's just, I just think there are too many resources that are more efficient and don't have any of the, you know, asking dumb questions in public feeling yeah. where you can sort of privately not know what you're doing. <laughs> 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 you know, we've all been there. Um, so, but, but membership programs, definitely another group thing. And well, I did, let, let's just toss out two more things. So mm-hmm. um, you made the point when you were talking about um, developers that there's some things that don't really translate well to membership. I think that's also true when you're dealing with a high-end corporate audience. Like if you're dealing with um, CFOs of Fortune 500 companies. Now, that doesn't mean you can't, right? If you are like the premier person serving them, it's absolutely possible. Mm-hmm. But if you're not... It's a challenge. And then the other thing with memberships is it's like this dirty little secret that I think that you have to have a certain size audience to make a membership work. Like if you've got an email list of 500 people Mm -hmm. and you're getting, you know, a one to two percent acceptance rate, which is pretty typical um, in. So you're not going to get the numbers to make this work. So you either have to have a highly, highly refined offering that relates heavily to your list. So if you have 500 people, maybe there's 100 people who fall into the category, so you've got a better chance of filling a membership, or you're growing your list and you're saying, all right, it's not 500, I'm gonna get it to 1,000, and then I'm gonna get it to 2,000, then then 5,000, and then the numbers can start to make sense. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I would not, you know, sort of blindly go into a membership test. I would say there's a lot of things I would try first before I got there. Yeah, like I I was looking at the next one on my list, which I would categorize as a much, much smaller group. And you could build, you could um, facilitate or sell mastermind type of things. Yeah, I love I love selling masterminds. It's 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 different. I mean, mastermind usually is a higher end offering, and you're doing small, curated groups. Um, now, mind has a beginning and an end. Not all masterminds do. There are some that you pay a monthly fee and you can stay in them forever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's you know you pull this group together and then you you go forward. But it's um it's a in, in my experience, and again, this is really just for me, I find it easier to sell masterminds than memberships. And it may just be um, how my audience sees me. It may be that I made mistakes in how I packaged it. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But I would say masterminds, when when you are really good at facilitating other people through a process... I think mastermind is a wonderful opportunity. I would not go into it blindly. There are a lot of really bad mastermind leads Mm -hmm. out there who think, oh yeah, I just put a bunch of people and we ask each other questions. I mean, you really do have to be a dedicated facilitator of the people in the group. And it's a skill set like consulting, like coaching. So uh, yeah, and the other piece is that it's something where it is group, but it has a high price tag. So right. you, you could do, um, depending on how you mix it with the other things you're doing, you could do one a year, you could do more than one a year. It can be a significant revenue stream. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I know someone who's selling them for 7500 bucks, and they last a few months and then you can uh, stay, you know, at a, if you want to stay in, you can at a lower price, but it's, it's mainly like a three or four month kind of experience. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many ways to do it. In fact, Michaelowitz does a one-day mastermind. I've never heard of that until I saw it on his site. Mm. And I'm trying to remember what he prices it at. It's not a lot, and it's virtual. It might be like $125 or something, And but there's no, maybe, or maybe it was 1000 I can't remember, but there was no limit to how many people could come. So he said he had a particular formula that he follows. I, I may go to one just to see what it's like. Mm, it just sounded interesting. really interesting. Yeah. yeah. I've heard of others where it's like, like your involvement is is like the seller's involvement is like it's almost like you know you get anywhere from six to ten people and present like a full day or two half days or maybe a, a day and a half 
of content. Like there's a very focused purpose for the mastermind. Then there's like an intense training period at the beginning. And then, um, you know, and then the seller sort of disappears more or less. And the, the masterminders are left to their own devices based on the information. See, that doesn't feel like a mastermind to me. So yeah, I, I could see that. The con I, I would argue, and again, you know, who cares? Like if your audience, if you call it a mastermind and your audience <laughs> loves it, go for it. There's no, there's no mastermind police. But I think to me, the mastermind is about you know, the master in each mind. It's not about the guru, right? It's about that person, that facilitator. That's how I think about it really is the facility, at least when I do it, I think of myself as the facilitator. So it's not that I don't have opinions, but I'm not the first one that shares them. The goal is to get the people in the group to share the wisdom and create this collective container of mm-hmm. wisdom. Yep. So yeah, so what you described to me feels more like something that's not a mastermind, but that maybe morphs into one after they go through the initial experience. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know what to call it. It's like a, a, a community of practice or like, I mean, I, I was certainly in a self-organizing thing where there was no real facilitator there's a person who started it invited everyone but he wasn't in charge it was just sort of democratic i guess i would yeah, i would call it a that's mastermind. a typical that's a typical like community organized mastermind where there you know you you somebody usually organizes it but they're not taking a fee mm. you're just finding other people who want to do this and you set up some rules and right. rules of community rules of engagement and then you go absolutely that's another way to do it you can't monetize that in that that way of doing it but yeah Yeah. there are reasons why you might want to do it though right okay so so let's see was there any other any other group there were no i think we touched on all the groupy type of things where you're you're delivering your expertise in a somewhat real time but it's one to many it's not like one to one which people are probably more used to um what about i think we we talked about some other things before the show sort of sort of the kind of virtual agency arbitrage model where you've got a big network of professionals and you're good at marketing and selling yourself and then you sort of assemble as super friends on the fly to deliver an engagement yeah so i've seen you know a bunch of these in different guises um the the example that i love just because there are so many zeros at the end of their (laughs) revenue and we're talking about monetizing so this is somebody who has a leadership consulting firm so leadership is kind of a broad word um but but what they do what what he does is he has a group of it changes maybe 20 to 30 sometimes 40 different contractors and these are all people who work with other firms and they're mostly people who are really good at what they do but hate to sell it right so they align with this guy so the way it works is he goes out to the client he's got great relationships been doing this a long time both inside corporation and as a firm and so he goes out and he sells the work he has the meeting he scopes the work and then he takes it back he looks at the group of contractors and thinks who would be the best fit and he chooses one or more depending on the project and he says to them okay here's the project here's how i've scoped it um you know and then there's an engagement process in the sense of it does this make sense to you is there something we didn't talk about that or that I didn't talk about that we should have so they work that out and then he says give me your price to do this project mm-hmm. not an hourly rate it's a price yep. and then he takes that price and maybe there's two people adds them together and then decides what he's going to charge the client he usually has something in mind but what's interesting is he's often making th- three times what the what he's paying the person and sometimes it's as much as five Mm -hmm. because he's he doesn't always um value price but often enough and so sometimes i know i know well so so what happens you know not infrequently is that he'll go back to the the consultant who gave him the the bid and said you know i really think this isn't enough for you. Mm. I really think you should charge more for this. Yep. And so, yeah, it's that's what happens when you don't want to sell and you let somebody else do the negotiation. So, you know, they're going to take that that big profit chunk. So uh, this gentleman was making well in excess of a million dollars a year. Mm. And yeah, it's it was a pretty simple model. No employees. No employees. 
Yeah, I, I have a, a longtime friend, a one-time coaching student who, do, and people that are in software development aren't going to believe this, but he does essentially the exact same thing with software development which mm. seems unheard of because most people would be like, oh, I can't give you a fixed price because the contractors have to give him a fixed price. And then he sometimes he'll sometimes he'll price the job up, up front because he was a value pricing proponent and he had huge like fortune 500 clients and what with long t term relationships with them. He'd like go from department to department inside of like a massive yes. pharmaceutical firm or whatever and and just sell new software to different departments and he would uh, sometimes he would be like he would come up with a price and then he'd go to his contractors and say like hey you know uh, i need this particular module built i think you'd be perfect for that can you give me a price for it and he wouldn't have it he would have it scoped out better than a client would but it's still a lot of uncertainty so there's trust that goes back and forth between him and the the um the uh, contractor where they both need to know that they've got each other's best interests in, at heart and, and so forth. And just like you said, if somebody said like, like, oh, yeah, I can do that for five thousand dollars. He might say like in his head, like, you don't understand. I, I, I didn't I, I must not have explained this well because I was expecting you to say thirty five thousand. Mm -hmm. and, and he would do the same thing where it was just like because he doesn't want them to end up feeling like they got killed on the project or they just wildly underestimated it. And so or he, they leave in the middle because they're so frustrated. Yeah, yeah. That would have never happened with him because he had such long term relationships with them that they would be like, ah, eh, I screwed myself on this one, but it'll all come out in the wash on the next one or whatever. Mm, but he would okay. he would want to head that off at the pass. And and that's a great way to build trust with someone in this model. It's like, hey, you said five, but let's call it ten. And just because yeah. I want to make sure that you're not upset about this if it turns into something squirrely like his spider sense was really good so yeah and so then he would get all of the contractors on board and he had about 10 different ones that he worked with regularly so he had reasonably deep bench because you'd never need all 10 at once and uh yeah and he he did great he does great yeah it's it's i guess we said this before we started recording it's arbitrage right, right? <laughs> you're making arbitrage on the people who don't want to sell their services um, and especially if you're really good at value pricing, like you can go out and you can create a really wide gulf between your expenses and your revenue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it so multiplies is, pretty fast. Mm -hmm. So that leads me, I think, naturally into the one that we talked about last week, which is a an e sort of even easier sort of training wheels version of this, I think, where uh, it separates your time from money, but it doesn't really change your daily activity. So let's say that, let's say that you're not great at sales yet. You've got some technical skill, obviously for me, I'm thinking of software development, but it could be anything. And the client needs it on an ongoing basis. It's the kind of thing they might hire an employee for, but, but for whatever reason, they don't want to do that or it's not an option. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I've got just an increasing number of people who are either in Ditcherville or I've been interviewing on Ditching Hourly that are selling these all-you-can-eat subscription hands work types types of things and they they're very focused in what is in scope what's out of scope they're very focused on essentially making a bunch of decisions twiddling a bunch of different knobs maybe six or seven different potential knobs to manage to, to prevent scope from going out of control and and basically just selling all you can eat access to whatever their technical skill is and they scope it in a way bet between what they'll do and who they'll work with getting very specific about who they'll work with and they can have like five or ten or more of these clients at the same time all paying like significant monthly recurring rates that um yeah that adds up to a, a serious income mm -hmm. and you can either either just keep doing that by yourself you could maybe uh, bring on some contractors or employees or i interviewed one guy that you know dialed the specificity all the way to the wall on who he would work with and what they would do and was onboarding a new client a day 
<laughs> every day in 2023 or whatever the year before I interviewed him. And he was like, and we're on track to like crush that number this year. And I was just like, dude, but he, you know, he had a lot of contractors at that point. And probably really finely tuned systems. Oh yeah. 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 hundred yeah. percent. I, mean, I, I hear that because onboarding a new client a day requires a really good system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he only had, I, I could be remember this wrong, but I think he only had one full-time employee. It was like his wife or something. And maybe a, a half-time employee, and then everybody else was contractors, and a whole bunch of automation. Yeah, yeah, I love that. <laughs> yes, so that's so that's sort of an all-you-can-eat uh, hands type of subscription. But there's also a very common one in Ditcherville where this sort of fractional CFO, CEO. Uh, sorry, not fractional CEO. It's like I've seen CMO, C CMO, FO, and CTO. C CTO, right? Those are yeah. the three that I've seen where the company just doesn't have that role filled or they're not ready to fill that role or someone just left and they need someone to bridge the gap. And yeah, I can I think of a half a dozen examples of people who have been very successful doing that sort of higher level. They're not coding and they're not doing running, you know, they're not doing creative for marketing campaigns or they're not, you know, whatever, doing the books. Um, but they're operating at this higher level, the executive level, and and selling access to their expertise on a monthly basis in this fractional way so that they can have multiple clients at the same time who are paying less than they would for an employee. But in aggregate, the you know fractional C whatever O is making way more than they would as a full-time employee. Yeah, I think the trick to really make fractionals work so it doesn't look like freelancing mm -hmm. is to put some guardrails around what you do and what you don't do. Because mm -hmm. you, you could argue, oh, so you get me a day a week. Like, no, that's not really, uh, that doesn't feel like something you can really grow a business on because you're going to tap out at five, yeah, five right. or, or four if you're going to be doing marketing and stuff like that. So it's finding the guardrails to make it something that you design and then they opt into versus right. you know you're filling their dream of a CMO which means they're you know they're calling you every 5 minutes with a, a new idea about marketing. <laughs> yeah, that's the the uh, the conversation around subscription of of either type is always around capacity. So the person who's considering offering themselves on this kind of all you can eat basis, you know, 24 seven unlimited questions, whatever it is, advisory retainers, uh, the person who hasn't done it yet, but is thinking about doing it, they're always concerned about like, but what happens if I get too busy? You know, like if I have, mm -hmm. and so I'm like, like I said, there's a bunch of dials you can turn to make that unlikely and if it does happen, there are things you can do to solve that problem. But the the thing to imagine, it seems like every time someone's first thinking about this, they're imagining just one client. And I'm like, no, you need to think about the, the you know, uh, Ron Baker calls it the portfolio, which I think is a little bit confusing term in this context. But you want to think about designing th your scope of involvement such that you could handle 10 at the same time, maybe mm -hmm. 20. And if you figure out a way to thread that needle in a way that is going to be delivering good ROI to your clients uh, and also keeping you on a sane schedule, whatever kind of schedule you want to be on, that's, I feel like that's the way to approach it. So like figure out, and so like, like you said, a d you get me one day a week. No, that's absolutely not. That will not work. Right. <laughs> Especially if you have to physically show up there. Oh, what? What? Yeah, I know. Blasphemy. Like, I realized you weren't thinking of that, but that's what where a lot of people start with this is is especially if they've been in a high visible, highly visible role in a local company like a, like a city like Chicago, New York, L.A., San Francisco. Yeah. You could you know play in your own backyard, so people would might expect you to physically show up. True. Good point. Yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> that no, won't no. work in this model. No. Um, okay, so let's see as the as the leaf blowers descend on my house in the background. <laughs> it's okay. Jackson's been making his protest a couple yes. times here. Well, hopefully I'll be able to tone it down in the in post, but uh, apologies, dear listener. Um, okay, so what I'm scanning down the list, we've touched on a lot of these. Um, did we, we said licensing right on the show? 
Or do we, we just did. talk about that before? Okay. We did, although, you know, I, there's one I'd like to just mention because it sort of spans the book and the licensing category. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is a guy who wrote a book and he figured out a way to get it as required reading to get state licensure for a particular profession. Nice. Right. And that was not easy, but but he did. So what he did is he charged one hundred and twenty five dollars for the book. So think about that. We're used to paying, you know, ten dollars for an ebook, yeah. twenty, twenty five for a physical book. These are one hundred and twenty five. And everybody who wants to get licensed or do continuing education in an entire state has to buy that book. And and so he also taught some of the training courses, but kind of almost gave them away. I think he charged like five hundred to a thousand dollars um in total to have a room full of people, but he was making $125 on each person in the room as well as people who didn't attend the sessions. So he had a very healthy six figure business where the book was a huge piece of it. Now, I, I would always argue I would want to back up to that because the state can also decide that they don't need your book anymore. Yeah, they can so shut that. Yeah. Yeah. Shut that puppy down. Usually they're pretty slow on these kinds of licensing things to change right. the requirements, but it could happen. So if I were doing that, I would definitely look for to develop a second um, significant stream of revenue just in case. Yeah, that would be overnight. Yeah. Yeah, I have a. I think I've mentioned before on the show. I have a, a someone in the extended family who wrote a college textbook that's been required reading for Psych 101 or some you know some class that like everybody has to take. And to talk about like you know the books, like, I don't know, over a hundred dollars. It's just printing like printing money, printing money for years and years and years. But you know, if that got switched off, it would instantly go away. Like I had a my iPhone book yeah. was. Uh, re- required reading so, sort of like uh, uh, what's it called it's like on the curriculum uh, for a right. whole bunch of colleges I, I don't know if O'Reilly O'Reilly kind of did partnership deals and went around and, and advocated for that I have no clue they might have they might not have it might not it might have just made it onto you know the syllabus at a bunch of sort of technical schools but yeah that accounts huh. for a lot of sales yeah, yeah, and it's it's the kind that you get when you're sleeping, which is the best kind. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And we've talked about we've talked about books at length in the past. So if you're looking for more information about that, just search the back catalog. Uh, but there's some there's some novel. There's something I don't know if our listeners would really want to do this or if they're in a position yet to do this. But there's this kind of like pay to play, paid placement thing that I've seen and you've seen with books. I've seen it with podcasts Um, and I'm not talking about sponsorships. Like that's certainly a thing you could sell. You could sell sponsorships to your newsletter or your podcast, but I'm talking about like paying to be a co-author or paying to be a guest. I have a client that's done that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, I'm trying to think of who it was, but there, there are like brand names that you can just, I think just major publishers, if they, if you want to pay them 30 grand, You've got a book deal. <laughs> well, yeah, Wiley actually is known for that. Um, so you, you know, you come up with an approach. I mean, they still have to like it. They're not just going to say yes no matter what. It has to fit with them. But you know, you pay to play. It's twenty anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand um, dollars. And the other one, I had a client do this where they were approached by a quote unquote guru, um, and they paid fifty thousand dollars to write a chapter in a book with 10 chapters. So do the math. (laughs) The person sponsoring the book, um, you know, had an advance of $500,000. And the people who paid 50 did that because they wanted to be associated with that name. It's like buying a little piece of celebrity. Right. That's wild. Yeah. But I mean, if if you've got the right kind of business model, something like that can make sense. Like if, if you've... The, the person who did that had the kind of business where it was very successful, but it was sort of a traditional consulting business. And by that, I mean, you had relationships with real people. You met them in person, 
right? You delivered a a, a core thing to a like Fortune, say, 1,000 group. And so that's the person that would have a hard time getting a conventional book deal because they're not big on social media. They don't have a mailing list of thousands, never mind tens of thousands. But for something like that, they could pay 50000 and they 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 get it all done for them. Now, if you're only making 50,000 a year, you wouldn't do that. But right. if you're making over a million, you know, 50 to get that kind of um, coverage isn't bad. That's not a bad investment, potentially. Right. So in theory, you could sell a bunch of, you could <laughs> charge a bunch of co-authors <laughs> to write your book for you. And <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's pretty funny when you think about it, yeah. but it's, it's so clever. And it, it goes, it's a little bit like the personality based live events, right? right? It's yes. how you leverage your, your expertise, your authority. And I'm going to add personality because I think that's important too. There, there are certain people that we just really like to follow or that we love to hate, right? But the ones that we love to hate, somebody else loves to love, mm. right? Would I pay $50,000 to co-author a book with Seth Godin? I don't know. See? I don't know. I actually don't know. That's not a hard I, yes I don't or a hard think, no. I don't think he would do it. But no, he no, strikes no. me as somebody who wouldn't like do that with his, his reputation. But yeah, I mean... Or like, um, yeah. Um, oh, who who just uh, retired? Um, Tom Peters. He didn't okay. do that either. He just wrote a million books himself. But somebody <laughs> like that, like if you were in the leadership space, and and this was you know ten years ago, um, you might pay fifty thousand dollars. Probably because he wouldn't do it, which would make it. Oh, I'd pay a hundred thousand. He still wouldn't do it, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, if anybody wants to pay $100,000 to me to write a chapter of my next book, just let me know. You can email me directly. <laughs> <laughs> at rm at rochellemolta.com. <laughs> <Right>. Yes. <laughs> right. But so the, the point of bringing this one up is, is like, I mean, just imagine who it like, it sounds, I like this one because it sounds so far fetched, like who would do that? Yeah. Sounds crazy. Right. But as an exercise listener, imagine if there is someone that you would pay five figures to to write a chapter in their book like who would it be for me the the one that popped to mind was seth godin it could be someone else for you uh, and then think like well is that is that in my future somewhere it's certainly a very interesting way to think about monetizing mm -hmm. your expertise yeah i mean it, it could go either way and mm -hmm. it's yeah it is an interesting it's it's interesting in the same way that at a conference I was at recently, the MC said, I want you to imagine the theme song for your life. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to point, I'm going to give you some time, but over the course of this conference, I'm going to point to you. And when I point to you, you're going to tell us the theme song of your life. Oh, you have to sing it. No, he <laughs> wasn't going to make him sing it. <laughs> da, 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 da. Remember, we can't all sing. <laughs> Uh, that would have yeah, been hilarious, like, though. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like it it gets in your head, and you're like, "Oh, who would I, who would I pay, hundred thousand dollars to write a chapter in their book?" I mean, yeah, it's really it's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, wild. I wonder if Stephen Pressfield is doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> finally find a way to get him on the show <laughs> if anybody knows steven pressfield personally we would love to have him on as a guest yeah that'd be awesome he's just come out with a new book and oh. speaking of uh did you see he's got some really interesting i'm gonna have to do this off the top of my head because i haven't looked at it for a few days but he's got um like a the high-end package which i think is a box with a book and some maybe note cards or flash mm. cards um, and it's signed. And then there's, and I think that's like uh, maybe $125. And then there's one for, I'm going to say 55. I could be wrong about that, which I think is just a, just a signed book. <laughs> so it's the hardcover and he's only doing it through his company. So you don't, you don't go through like Amazon or any of that. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. you know, it's kind of like what Seth Godin did a few years ago with packaging one of his books where he did like sets and you could, buy certain sets and some were autographed and some weren't yeah they came with like bonus yeah pamphlets and stuff yeah i've got yeah. A, a student who's doing this i just ran across another guy online who is doing the exact same thing there's sort of this he had a great name for it now i can't remember it was like uh you know the 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 premium it wasn't premium it was a premium package but it's just like you said it was like a bundle of you know it'd be like if 
well, I think he might actually have this. Like James Clear's got a bunch of products related to atomic habits, like the daily planner oh. and the, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, but it's like all bundled together in one thing. Just 125 is kind of a good deal actually. Well, and what I, what I neglected to mention is with Pressfield, this newest book is related to resistance and the war of art and resistance was his big thing. I mean, that was his big idea, his revolution right. from that book. And he's written a bunch of books since then. Mm -hmm. So it's, and again, it, it feels like it's a way to monetize something that already existed. And then he just dug deeper. Right. And said, here's some more stuff about resistance. And here's some, and again, I haven't read the book, so I'm only speculating. But here are some ways you can deal with resistance. Here's what you tell yourself when it happens. I mean, I reread that book before I started writing my book, because I wanted that anti-resistance thing in my head <laughs> as I was writing. So the, the I resistance of inoculation. Yeah, it's a totally logical thing for him to do, and it would amaze me if it didn't monetize really, really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people can buy all of his stuff instead of working on what they should be. Working on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> a great way to procrastinate. <laughs> All right, I can hear that these uh, these these wasps the in the background yeah. are not going away. So um, I think we've covered pretty much everything on my list. Uh, what about yours? Anything oh, else? Yeah, that that book was the last piece on mine. All right, cool. Well, all right, folks, that's it for this week. I'm Jonathan Stark, and I'm Rochelle Moulton, and we hope you join us again next time for the Business of Authority. Bye. Bye bye. Hopefully without leaf blowers. Yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs>